Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to your own Silicon Valley Tech Talks channel. This is your host, Faisal Vatu from Redwood City, California. I'm here at SR1 Capital Management Office today. SR1 is one of the prominent venture capital firms investing in biotech and life sciences. Their mission is to translate the new technologies into next generation of medicine to help patients in many different ways. We are fortunate to have Simeon George as our guest today. Simeon is CEO and managing partner of SR1. He co-founded SR1 at the time of his spin-off from GSK in 2020, raising over $1 billion fund across the two ventures. In today's show, we'll learn about the trends in biotech industry and also the opportunities for entrepreneurs. So without any further delay, let's go and talk to Simeon and learn from his insights. Hello, Simeon. Hi. Welcome to our show. How are you doing today? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, having me on your show. Great. So, Simeon, in your perspective, what are the most promising trends in biotech and life sciences industry? Uh, in other words, how do you see this industry shaping up in the next five to 10 years? Okay, great. Um, so, as you mentioned, I'm an investor in life sciences, which is um, within the healthcare space, the largest area of innovation. So if you think about the healthcare space, it's roughly a two, $2 trillion industry right now. And um, of that, roughly two thirds of the innovation, the venture capital dollars go towards investments in life sciences. Um, and within life sciences, there are different sectors. There's biotech, which you noted, uh, there's devices, there's diagnostics, uh, there's research tools. And where we focus and where we spend most of our time is on the therapeutic side. Um, developing new medicines, new drugs to treat cancer, autoimmune disease, viruses, things like that. Uh, and so that segment is probably about two thirds or more of the life sciences overall sector spend and interests. And so diving into that question, like that's where we focus within within the core mission of, of SR1, which is the fund that I, I lead. Um, and within that sector, we, we, we look at everything. We follow the science. And so we look at diseases from head to toe. Um, so we're looking at new diseases to treat neurodegenerative diseases like um, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. We look at new treatments for cancer, uh, autoimmune diseases. We've all just lived through you know, this global pandemic. So we look at new treatments or vaccines for viruses, right? So we're essentially following innovation that's happening in real time. And that innovation can come from research centers in the US, Europe, Asia, it can come from entrepreneurs, founders that are starting with some, some novel approaches to developing products. Um, and so we're, we're generally quite flexible in terms of where we look. And if you were to ask me where the innovations are coming, they're coming everywhere. Like this is, there's probably no better time to be starting a company, investing in a company, building a company in life sciences right now. Um, and a lot of that um, innovation is being shaped by a lot of the forces that you're well aware of. So how does technology impact the work that we're doing? So computation, AI, ML, how do we think about the massive amounts of data that's being generated and how do we now tease out a signal from that data and then apply it across the different use cases that I just described? You mentioned about artificial intelligence and yeah. digital transformation earlier, right? Yeah. So uh, can you dive a little bit deeper on how these new technologies yeah. can play a role in biotech and life sciences ecosystem? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I think it'll touch every part of our ecosystem, right? So, um, I mean, the easiest way to think about it is ultimately we want to try and increase the probability of success of bringing products through to market. Mm -hmm. And we want to do this in a manner that is both, both time and capital efficient, right? So can you do things in a faster, better, cheaper manner? Uh, and fundamentally, I think the computation capabilities allow us, we believe, and we've seen firsthand uh, examples where this is the case, right? So increasing probability of success, decreasing the timelines, decreasing the cost required. Um, and you know, the most notable examples that we've all lived through is just the, the development of these novel vaccines or antiviral therapies to combat COVID. Mm -hmm. We've seen timeframes that have been compressed to a scale that would have been like when I was in medical school, like you wouldn't have even thought possible, right? Going from years to be able mm -hmm. to go from research to preclinical testing, to clinical testing, to FDA or European regulatory approval, to shrinking it to less than you know 18 months. And you know I think in part, clearly it was because there was a dramatic societal need to bring a product forward. In part, it was also because of this immense technological advantage that we now have. 
And so across our portfolio, we have companies that are really using this technology as an enabling feature to help them do initial screening as they're trying to identify products that they're going to move forward. So compressing the time frame, identifying novel targets based on unique insights from biology, genetics, computation, other, other scientific databases to be able to, again, tease out a new signal. Um, and efficiency in the way that you can identify which patients are more likely to re respond favorably to your therapy. So we call it like patient stratification. So rather than thinking of cancer as a um, disease where it's one therapy for millions of people, it's can you identify the specific pain point that's causing that disease and design a tailored therapy to be able to treat that particular patient or patient population. Um, so that's, I'd say, on the front end. And then on the back end, as you think about bringing your product forward through regulatory into commercialization, again, it's how do you make sure that you're developing the most efficient way to be able to distribute your product so that it's going to the right patients? How do you develop the right data sets to be able to go to the payers, the insurers, and say, this is the value you're going to see to your system because of what we've shown so far? Uh, and so it's dramatic, like it, it'll transform everything that we're doing over the coming years. There are great benefits as you just elaborated. Yeah. But do you see the startup ecosystem in biotech and life sciences adopting this like quickly or slowly yeah. or at the pace is very slow? Yeah. How do you see that adoption of these technologies yeah. to achieve all what you just explained? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, I um, my my instinct, and again, I'm not a, I'm not on the tech side, but mm. my instinct is probably biotech is a little slower to adopt than technology, mm. uh, pure tech, I guess. Um, but it's happening, as I said, like what I've described to you, like mm. within our portfolio companies, we're seeing uh, firsthand that they're doing this and they're maybe doing this in a siloed manner. Like they're picking one segment and they're saying, this is where we're gonna use computation, AI, ML to really mm. deliver value. Um, you know, I think over time it'll become part and parcel of what we're doing. And as there's more success, as you see num the number of products hopefully increasing in terms of success rates, timelines, then it'll become something that I think will become more ubiquitous over time. How does uh, SR1 approach identifying and selecting the new investment opportunities? Yeah. Are there any typical traits in an opportunity which yeah. make it more attractive for you? Yeah, good question. So we generally like to be proactive about how we approach sourcing of ideas. So rather than just waiting for something to fall on our desk or on our email, we are actually think developing investment theses. We follow the science. We are going to different conferences, meeting with entrepreneurs, other investors, pharma companies to try and get a sense of what's happening in the ecosystem, right? And then we develop a thesis and we'll say, okay, within cancer, these sorts of innovations we're seeing, targeted therapies going after XYZ mutations. And then we try and identify which are the startups, the entrepreneurs that are working on these problems. And we try and get to know those companies. So even before that company reaches out to us, we hopefully have some sense of what the landscape looks like. So that's one, one way, it's a prepared mind sort of proactive approach. Um, the next thing we do is really focus on um, people. Who are the high quality founders, entrepreneurs, scientists that we want to spend time with, we want to get to know, understand what they're working on uh, and follow their passions, their interests. And that's another way to sort of triangulate. Uh, and then the third one is probably, you know, thinking about products themselves and really identifying from a clinical unmet needs standpoint, where, the, where are the disease areas where we believe if you can bring a new product to market, there's significant uh, impact for patients and impact for from a financial return standpoint. So those are the things we think about. Um, and sort of happy, I guess, if you're gonna ask me in terms of what companies or entrepreneurs can do to, to, to sort of stand out, I think it's getting to know us and vice versa, allowing us to sort of understand their journey, what they've done before, why are they passionate about what they're working on now, and why is now the right time to be investing in their company. Uh, Simon, I'm sure you have a lot of insights into the startup ecosystem of biotech and life sciences. Are there any challenges and risks which you have found unique and very specific for this ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's it's an incredibly dynamic ecosystem. And you know, I think the biggest challenge is that 
it takes quite a bit of capital and time to be able to go from like science to mm -hmm. medicine. And so it's how do you continue to fund those companies? Uh, how do you think about ways to sort of drive value in your business um, to convince investors to put more money to work, to convince pharma companies to think about partnership or M&A, uh, to, to think about the path to future development. You know, we're talking about products that can take seven to 10 years to go through different steps mm -hmm. of, of clinical development and can cost tens, if not hundreds of millions, right? So I think it's just the financial constraints of being able to do this um, is not for the faint of heart, right? So you need to be able to, to really be thoughtful around how you build value, how you continue to support the business. Mm -hmm. How does uh, SR1 collaborate with its portfolio companies beyond the financial support? Yeah. Uh, specifically, how do you differentiate yourself yeah. versus the other VC firms working in the same space? Yeah, I mean, this is definitely one of our biggest selling points. So we pride ourselves on being more than just a checkbook or cash access to capital. Mm -hmm. We have on my team um, executives who have been sort of in the throes of what I just described, building companies, raising capital, partnering with pharma companies, taking companies public, transacting on those companies. So those individuals are there and they work across the portfolio and they spend time with first time founders, entrepreneurs, helping them think through some of these key points. How do you build a team? What are the key uh, resources that you need to be able to scale up? How do you access capital? Who are the investors you should be talking to? As you're preparing to go public, how do you sort of make sure that you have the right capabilities? You're, you know, you're sort of thinking through three steps of where you are today. So a lot of those things, in particular on the financing side, are capabilities that the team mm -hmm. can bring to bear. And then on the pharma side, again, a key sort of constituent within our ecosystem is engagement with the large players, the large pharma companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's how do you ensure that there's the right connectivity with mm. R&D leaders, with business development leaders? How do you make sure that it's happening over time in a very substantive way? And so again, we have colleagues on my team that spend time really nurturing that part of the, the relationships in the ecosystem and ensuring that our portfolio companies mm. can benefit from that. In your observation, um, have there been any, you know, mistakes or misconceptions in the founder community of uh, biotech startup ecosystem and you will recommend them to avoid? Yeah, um, I mean, listen, we're, we make mistakes all the Good. time, right? Like, you know, yeah. the, the beauty of working in these early stage um, setups is, like you, you know, you're hopefully learning from your mistakes. You're not mm -hmm. making the same mistakes over. Um, and so, you know, I think key missteps, again, I think it's one is just having a clear sense of what the purpose is of what you're working on. You know, how do you efficiently continue to de-risk from science to product and what are the key steps there? How much capital do you need? So mm. I'd say w the mistakes that we see that we make also is not having a like a um, linear site towards path to value creation, like being very clear around that. Mm. And if you don't have that, you can spend time and money on things that are not ultimately what's gonna drive value. Um, then the second key one would be on the hiring side. Like, do you have the right capabilities on your team, right? Mm. Scientific, financial, business development, you know, all those key capabilities mm. need to come to bear in a startup. And so it's ensuring that you have the right resources and as the company is growing and scaling, ensuring that you're continuing to develop the organization. Simon, thank you very much yeah. for joining our show. Sure. I'm sure our audience would have learned a lot from your insights. Oh, I hope so, thank you. Yeah, thanks for thanks. your questions. Good.